how, how often, let me just, this, I want to frame up our conversation this morning uh, with this question. How often do you say no to yourself? I don't mean, like, how often does your wife say no to you and so you can't do it? <laughs> how often do you say no to yourself? Not the obligation, well, if I, if I do this, I'll get fired from my job so then I don't do it. That's not really you saying no to it. It's, you know, there's external pressures causing you to say no to yourself. I'm saying just where you go, nah, I don't really think that's something that I'm gonna choose to do right now because that's not healthy or that's not good or whatever the reason is. How often do we say no to ourselves? I think, I think the answer to that, and maybe this is just my own <laughs> personal bias showing through, it happens a lot less. I do it a lot less than what I realize. I think more often than not, when I'm saying no, it's not actually me saying no, it's other, it's other things saying no to me and me being like, okay, I'll go along with that. Um, so I was running yesterday. I'm trying to, I'm starting, to, I wanna get in shape. I used to be in shape, I'm not in shape. I, whatever, it's a thing. I don't wanna talk about it. But here I am talking about it. And, um, and so I'm like, I'm gonna start running, I'm gonna start working out. And part of it is, is because of that reason. It's literally because I don't feel like I say no to myself enough. And so I like need to whip myself in shape a little bit and go like, no, like my comfort doesn't get to call the shots and everything. Like there are things that I'm gonna choose to do because it's, because it's wise, because it's good, you know, because I feel better, because my mind is more clear, all that stuff, right? So I'm, I'm, that's the reason why I'm starting to work out. One of the main reasons, other than like physical health and mental health. Um, and I'm running yesterday and I, I, I got to a mileage that I'm comfortable with, and it wasn't enjoyable getting to that point, I'll tell you that, but I got to like where I'm comfortable with, and I had had a plan that I was gonna, like I wanna extend my mileage a little bit, so I'm gonna push out that mileage a little bit more, run a little bit further than I'm uh, comfortable with. And it was crazy in my mind the amount of, dude, you've done so good already. You've gone so far. Bro, think about where you were like, like a month ago, two months ago. Like you're doing awesome. You don't, you don't need to go further than what you just went. And I'm like running and I'm kind of being dragged by my dog too at the same time. And I'm like, no, you said you were gonna go further. You gotta go further. And then it's like, yeah, but it would feel so good to walk right now, wouldn't it? And you've done, and your heart rate will still be up and walking will still be good for you. Like you, I mean, are you saying that people that walk and don't run, that they're not as good as you are? This is what's going on in my mind. And I'm like, no, I'm not saying that they're not as good as I am. I'm just saying, I know I need to keep running. And okay, the, like the battle in my mind, and I'm just, and I started laughing when I finally pushed through it and I got to the mileage that I was wanting to do. I was, I like, I've just started laughing going like, dang, it's real people, like it is, the, the, the power of comfort in my life, the power of, of enjoyment and the sway that that has over the decisions that I make in my life, it's real. It's real. It is not an easy thing to say no to ourselves, to say no to our comfort. So that's what I want to talk about this morning. That's kind of where we're going. So we're in this series uh, called Lessons in Vapor Management. This is our vapor maker here to remind us of what we're talking about. Um, Studying Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is a really wise man named Solomon who had everything you could ever hope for, and he tried to squeeze life out of all of these different aspects, like squeeze meaning in life out of all these different aspects of life, and he was left wanting. And he just kept saying over and over again in the book of Ecclesiastes, I sought meaning in all of these different kinds of things, but then I realized that their meaning meaningless. Pleasure is meaningless. Work is meaningless. Money and possessions, it's meaningless. Knowledge, it's meaningless. And that word meaningless can be translated as vapor. And he's going, I tried to extract it. I tried to anchor myself to it. I tried to, and it just left me wanting, right? So we've been looking through all the things that Solomon tried to hitch his wagon to in order to try to find purpose. And crazy, uh, they're all things that we try to hitch our wagon to and find meaning from in life as well. And uh, the scripture I want to read to you this morning to kind of frame up, again, the series idea and what we're talking about this morning is Jeremiah 2.13. Uh, Jeremiah said, for my pe this is God speaking through Jeremiah the prophet, he said, for my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. He's saying, Jesus said, I'm, I'm the living water. If you'd come to me, you would never thirst again, right? 
God is saying, I, I'm the living water, and my people have done two things. They've turned their back on me. They've walked away from the source of living water, the actual refreshment, nourishment, life-giving water that we deeply need. We've turned our backs on that, and then more than turning our backs on that, we've, he says they've dug cisterns, wells, caverns to hold water, but they've done a faulty job of it, and the caverns have cracks in them, and they can't hold water. And so not only are we not going to the true source of life, but we're scrambling around trying to find a source of life in all these other places, but there's cracks in them, and they can't sustain us. This is what our series is all about. These things can't sustain us, and it's not that they're bad in and of themselves. Most of them, they're, they're just fine things, like even what we're talking about this morning. Pleasure, pleasure is not bad. Contrary to popular belief, God is not a killjoy. He's not interested in us just being miserable all the time, and he doesn't just say no to all the good things. In fact, Scripture says that he's a good father who knows how to give good gifts to his children. But how many of us know, like, kids want all the things, and they don't, like, okay, we have this, one of our children, I have to be careful, one of our children, um, we have a saying in our house because this child is obsessed with sour cream. (laughs) Like obsessed with sour cream. And we'll load half of a container of sour cream onto a single taco if they're allowed to do that. And so we have a saying in our house all the time. We're like, hey, you gotta regulate yourself with the sour cream. Like don't make me, don't make me tell you how much you can put. I wanna see you regulate the sour cream in your life right now. Like that's the move that you need to make, right? Because kids don't, regulate anything. If they have the opportunity, they will eat candy every second of every day from the time they wake up in the morning to the time they fall back asleep and crash from a sugar, you know, sugar, right? We all know this. This this is the reality of it. Kids don't say no. Um, This is, this is, it's not that these things are bad in and of themselves. It's that we as human beings are like children, and a lot of times we don't know how to say no to ourselves and we get things out of alignment and out of their proper perspective, and we end up on the wrong track. So this morning, Solomon's view of pleasure. And again, I want to frame it a little wider in our ability to say no to ourselves, even to say, like, not just pleasure, but even comfort, enjoyment, okay? Uh, Too much of a good thing can actually be a bad thing. Um, So Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 11, this is a longer passage, but this is Solomon saying this, and, and again, pretty depressing take on life. Just wait, there'll be one even more depressing that we're going to get to. Um, (laughs) But we'll bring it around, okay? Uh, Ecclesiastes 2.1, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless, vapor. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine, and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. They lived in a desert, so that was a big deal. Uh, I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born into my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers. Look, you don't have Spotify back in the day, okay? So he's like, I have like live Spotify, male and female singers. I want it. They sing it for me. That's what we do, all right? And the harem as well. That is an understatement. Solomon had, between wives and concubines, which concubines were women that you kept around just for physical enjoyment. They weren't, they weren't even wives, okay? A thousand women between wives and concubines. So saying he had a harem is like, I don't know. It's kind of a, he's not, he's being honest, but he's like not really laying it out there, just how crazy uh, the life that he was living uh, was. He says the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I would debate that, but um, who am I to, whatever. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart 
took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Now, I know that there's a tendency We've mentioned this a couple times in this series. There's a tendency for us to be like, well, yeah, but that's, I mean, he's ridiculous. Like, that's, of course, like, look how crazy opulent and extravagant and everything was. And I will just throw this out there to you. I have gone many, many places in the world. This strikes me almost every time either I mow my lawn or I have my children mow my lawn or my wife mows our lawn or whatever. Um, I've been a lot of places in the world, and it is crazy to me the amount of places that people would never, ever think about spending time and money on landscape for aesthetic reasons. And yet, like, we all do it, some of us just because we have to. We're like, well, if it grows too long, then the village like puts a thing on my door and finds me and I, you know, whatever. But, but, even, but even still, we own a lawnmower, right? We have, we have a tool for that particular task. And there are so many places in the world where like, that is, nobody's even considering that because there are way more things for them to be concerning themselves with, right? And we just sort of take it as like, I mean, you know, that's what happens when you own a house which is another thing. Okay, all this, no guilt in having a lawn, water it, make it beautiful. Like there's nothing better than walking barefoot in green grass that feels like carpet under my feet. Like that is, that is a thing of beauty. I've loved that since I was a kid. You wouldn't know that going by my house right now. I just have different priorities in my life, but but I've loved that since I was a kid. But the, the point just being, don't look at Solomon and go, okay, but that's ridiculous. There's a high percentage of the world that look look at our lives and go, that's ridiculous how we live, all of us, okay? So the point is not to go like pleasure, Solomon, crazy levels of pleasure and extravagance and yeah, don't try to extract meaning from being super rich and you know, that kind of a guy, but instead to go, okay, but just what about in general, that comfort seeking that we all have? Like the other night, you know, it started getting cold two weeks ago. We started having like cold nights and had to, like we literally, we we made chicken, my wife makes homemade chicken noodle soup, so good, like so comforting and so cozy. And then we switched the sheets on our beds to flannel sheets and I'm like, that's luxury right there, people. That is like, that is awesome. It's the little things in life. I don't really care for the flannel sheets as much, but she really likes them, okay? I get too, I get too hot, but none of you care. Um... (laughs) I, <laughs> um, but, but even, even that, so like there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with enjoying chicken noodle soup on a cold day. There's nothing wrong with having flannel bed sheets. Like those are, those are good things, good enjoyments. God wants us to have good gifts. Like that's good and it's fine. There's a danger when we start to chase that feeling. There's a danger when it's not just isolated things here and there, but our life begins to be ordered around comfort and around enjoyment. And I I would wager, I can only speak to my life, but I would be willing to wager that there's, there's a whole lot more of us that lean more towards Solomon's way of approaching enjoyment and pleasure than we really want to admit. Or maybe even than we've just realized. We have maybe we haven't even realized it. Because that's a possibility too, because we're swimming in a certain kind of cultural water and it's really easy to not even realize that we're being formed and shaped in that water. Um, One of the aspects of that cultural water that we're swimming in, I wanna talk about, and it's been forming our culture since, probably since the 1960s. When you look at just the, I mean the sexual revolution is like the, the headliner of that, but it was kind of a general philosophy, a way of living. Um, that's really influenced by hedonism. And I, I don't think a lot of people in our culture would be like, yes, I'm a hedonist, right? I mean, because we, we think of hedonism and it's like, it's just debauchery, and it's, which there is that in our culture. But like we, we would never, I, I'm not a hedonist, right? But maybe, maybe our values are colored and shaped a little bit more by that than what we realize. So hedonism, um, and hedonism would say that the purpose of life 
is pleasure, to enjoy life, to have good experiences, and then to experience pleasure in our life. Now again, very few people would go, yes, that is the purpose of my life, is to enjoy and experience pleasure, but if you looked at the way that we order our lives, if you could look into the inner workings of my mind while I'm trying to run and everything that's yelling at me to stop doing this because I'm like going against the grain of what's good in life by, by choosing to do something that's uncomfortable, right? We're actually shaped by this more than what we realize. It's this idea that the purpose of life is, is to experience pleasure, to enjoy good things. And so in that worldview, in that frame of mind, again, it's kind of a silent worldview, but in that frame of mind, sin would be defined as anything that keeps us from pleasure. Do we see that at all in our culture? Anyone that says that we shouldn't do what we want to do, it's wrong. It's actually sin to, to, to say no to myself. It's sin to say no to other people. It's sin to, to not give full vent and expression to what I desire in my heart. Um, it's this idea that the world is a playground that the world exists for me to enjoy. It's there for my maximum pleasure. So I can travel, so I can live in luxury as much as I'm able to in my life, whatever I can work and attain, and however much luxury I can have. It's, you know, it's extreme sports. It's to feast on delicious food. It's to consume entertainment. It's to engage in whatever sexual pleasure we want to engage in. All of these different kinds of things. It's like, we we don't say no to ourselves because that's bad. Because what is the point of life if it's not to enjoy good things, right? So here's here's a, um, the the world just exists as a conduit for our pleasure in some ways. Here's, Here's something that might help us see. Again, this isn't the only influence in our culture, but it's one of them. Um, Parenting. Parenting used to be, um, the point of parenting, probably unspoken, but it used to be to get good character into the next generation so that they're not idiots and they don't destroy the world. I mean, that's kind of, I mean, that's your, like, baseline responsibility as a parent, right? Like, that's that's the main thing. Um, I think that that's, it seems to me that that's kind of changed. You hear people say, and again, the, I'll, I'll be honest in a minute, but you hear people say things like, I just want my kids to have good experiences in life. I just want them to have a good childhood. Okay, now that's not bad. We should want to give our kids good gifts because God is a good father who wants to give us good gifts. But we also have to say no because good fathers and mothers say no, right? Right? So it's this, again, it's not that all of what you would say hedonism is wrong. Again, it's not like God wants us to be stoic and we just don't ever engage in anything that's enjoyable because that's the way of Jesus. I mean, get out of here with that. That's not, show me where that is in scripture. That's nowhere, okay? Unless you pluck a few verses and take them out of context. But there is all kinds of stuff in scripture about keeping things in the right perspective. And I I remember um, my parents were over and uh, one of our kids had a neighborhood kid that was going to sleep over, was going to spend the night. And um, it was planned, he was going to come over, and <clears throat> we hear a knock on the door, and we're like, oh, he's, and, and this family goes to CLF too. And I didn't ask for their permission, so I'm not saying their names. Uh, so, um, but it was, it was awesome. This family, like, we hear a knock at the door, and we're like, oh, that's so-and-so that's coming over to sleep over with one of our children. And we go to the door, and it's the father and this son, and we're like, oh, come on in. And, you know, are you, do you want to hang out too? Like, what's happening here? You know, whatever. And he walks in and he goes, um, he points to his son and he goes, uh, he has something that he'd like to say to you. And super embarrassed and awkwardly, this like young child just said, um, I'm sorry to tell you that I can't spend the night tonight um, because I was told to do this, this, and this at my house, and um, I was dishonest, and I said that I had done it, but I hadn't done it, and so um, as part of my consequences, I can't, I can't spend the night. Hopefully, I can do it a different time, and we're like, oh, thank you for coming over and, and saying that. Like, I'm sorry that you're having to deal with consequences, but this is a good opportunity for you to learn, and you know, whatever else, and then, and then the, da- the dad was just there, kind of moral support, and also to make sure that it happened, uh, the conversation <laughs> happened, and, <clears throat> and turned around and walked out, 
And I remember my dad was, was in the room, and I remember my dad just being like, that was awesome. Like, you don't see people do that anymore. That is the exception, not the rule. And I would submit it's because we're swimming in water that is colored by hedonism. We don't want to say no because we want them to have good experiences, right? So, <clears throat> so the attitude in that hedonistic flavored culture, the attitude towards faith becomes, well, why would, why would any good faith ask me to say no to my internal desires? Why would any kind of good faith want me to have any kind of a check? That seems old-fashioned. That seems retroactive. Like, haven't we advanced past that? And the solution that it proposes to the issues in the world is we just need to chill out. Less rules. Relax a little bit. Enjoy yourself a little bit. If it doesn't hurt anyone, just do it. If it doesn't hurt anyone, just do it. Experience the world. Express yourself. Say yes to your desires. Get rid of your hang-ups. Look inside. What is your heart telling you? Okay? I got news for you. Your heart will lie to you. <laughs> My heart will lie to me. My heart wanted to be on a couch instead of running yesterday, okay? My heart will lie to me. But our culture and we fall prey to this kind of mentality. It's just, what is your heart telling you to do? Just do it. Less rules, more pleasure, and the world will be better. And there's this idea kind of coming out of the 60s that if people would just give in to their desires, whatever those were, and a lot of it had to do with sexual stuff, but desires in general, if people would just give in that most of the world's ills were as a result of, you know, go Freud on this, but it's a result of repressed sexual desires. And so if people would just stop repressing themselves and just live your life, man, and just enjoy everything that's good and just follow your hearts, then wars would cease. And Russia would never invade Ukraine. And yet here we are. And, and I, like, I don't know if you, I felt that. I felt this like, when Russia invaded Ukraine, I felt this like, aren't we past that? What, what is it in my mind that would tell me that we're past that, that civilization has somehow advanced past brokenness in humanity? It's believing this lie that, man, if we would just live in this particular way, everything would be so much better. And the results are coming in. It hasn't changed things. Humanity's still broken giving in to our desires nonstop, seeking enjoyment, trying to extract meaning from those things in our life, it's not fixing everything. And I'll tell you, this is, um, I was listening to somebody talk about this, um, and they brought this up, I thought it was a great point. Um, this started with, if you were looking politically, this started on the political left in the 60s with liberalism, but it has not stayed with just liberalism. Liberalism would look at this and culturally and politically go, keep your laws off of my body, right? But it has infiltrated into conservatism just as well. In conservatism, it's don't tread on me, which stings for me because I would have more of a libertarian, I don't want the government telling me what I'm supposed to do, kind of a, like that's kind of my natural leaning like Ron Swanson kind of, I just want to, like, that's my, um, so even hearing that going like, ooh, yeah, this, this crops up in all kinds of sneaky ways. If I want to be able to do what I want to be able to do, and I don't want anybody or anything else to tell me what I can and cannot do. And if we're not careful, that translates into our relationship with Jesus. And we can imagine him always just going, sure, go ahead and do that. Sure, follow your heart. Sure, if that makes you feel good, why, I'm a good God. Why wouldn't I want you to do whatever you want to do? We can imagine that that's his mode of operating, and it's not. It's not his mode of operating. So Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 19, he says, he's talking about this. He's talking about human beings who live in this particular way. 
He says, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Man, that's not nice. He's going, listen, the natural result of moving in this way where we never say no to ourselves, where we allow our desires and pleasure to dictate our decisions on a constant basis, the path that is on is a path that leads to destruction. We're seeing it in our cultures. We see it in our own lives when we do that. Again, let's not point the blame at the culture and never look at ourselves and go like, yes, all the culture is this way, but like me, when I do this, there's damage that's done in my marriage, with my children, in my finances, in my soul. There's damage that's done when I live that way. And I find it interesting that Paul says their God is their stomach. He's saying we don't even realize it, but we're letting our appetites drive everything for us. He's not just taking a shot at overeating, although that's a thing too. If there is a thing as having too much of a good thing. And he continues, he says, their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship as followers of Jesus is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, this is not saying enjoyable things are bad. I will have an afternoon nap today. I do it on Sundays, most, most Sundays. I will take a nap, and I will love every minute of it. It will be enjoyable. I will not feel guilty. The Lord does not condemn that. It will be wonderful, right? Get, this is not, so do not hear me saying that. Again, it's back to our opening scripture about turning away from living water and going to broken cisterns and trying to find satisfaction from that. It's about what is most important, what's actually driving the decisions in my life. What's in the driver's seat of my life? And if it's pleasure and enjoyment, we're in a danger zone. We're in a danger zone, and we need to pay attention to that. Because where that leads, what Paul said about their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame, their mind is set on earthly things, where that leads to when we're trying to extract meaning from those things is, here's another verse from Solomon, Ecclesiastes 9, 7. He says, go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. Oh, and we're like, this is nice. Always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. All your meaningless days. <laughs> I, dude, I mean, how, you just, he's a bummer, but um, <laughs> For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead, where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. <laughs> okay? You know, again, it's not all the things that we're like, oh, that's nice. It is nice. If you're married, you should enjoy life with your wife. You should enjoy good food, and you should enjoy the fruits of your hard labor. Those are all good things. They are not life. There is more to life than that. They are good gifts from God. They are, those pleasures in life that we all enjoy, they make wonderful gifts from God. They make terrible gods. Terrible gods. But that's what we try to make them into. Now, the solution is not some form of, like I said, stoicism where we just deny ourselves and it's asceticism where we, like, just anything the flesh wants, we don't give it to ourselves. We just deny ourselves and we're forceful and hot. Like, that, that is not the solution. I love what John Ortberg says about this. <clears throat> he says, uh, true celebration is the inverse of hedonism. Hedonism is the demand for more and more pleasure for personal gratification. That's the definition of selfishness. It always follows the law of diminishing returns so that what produced joy in us yesterday no longer does today. Our capacity for joy diminishes. Celebration is not like that. When we celebrate, we exercise our ability to see and feel goodness in the simplest gifts of God. 
We are able to take delight today in something we wouldn't have even noticed yesterday. Our capacity for joy increases. It's the idea of, are the good things in life a stopping point and a filling station for us? Or do the good things in life point us to deeper meaning? Do they point us to a good God behind the good things? If they point us to a good God, they're great. If we make them the stopping point and the filling station for our souls, again, that's where we run into trouble. And so the issue is making sure that we're delighting in the Lord first and foremost. We said the first week that we did this, Jesus said to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else will be added to us. If we scrape and claw for all of the other things, we lose the kingdom of God and we lose the goodness of God. But if we latch on to the goodness of God, he gives us everything else in life with us and it's a blessing instead of a curse. But we have to keep first things first. Psalm 34, 8 says, and I love this, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He is a good and loving father. He gives good gifts to his children. Don't just know that intellectually. Taste and see. Experience God's goodness in your life. That's what we're being directed to do. Jesus said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He is the living water. He is the bread of life. He and he alone satisfies our deepest longings and our deepest desires. And when we learn to locate all of the rest of our life in our relationship with him, it redeems everything else in our life. But seeking the kingdom first does require us to say no to ourselves. <clears throat> it does. Because Jesus said, I'm, I'm the bread of life and you won't be hungry again if you feast on me and I'm living water and if you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. But he also said things like Luke 9, 23, <clears throat> where Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it but whoever loses their life for me will save it. We have to have a theology and a relationship with Jesus that holds both of these truths in tension. <clears throat> that God is good and he wants us to taste and see that he's good, but he's also a God who says, hey, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. So there's different reasons why we say no to ourselves. Sometimes we say no to ourselves because that thing doesn't line up with the kingdom of God. And God gets to determine what his values are and what's okay and what's not okay. Our culture doesn't. My own desires doesn't get to determine that. And so sometimes we say no to ourselves because this seems really good and I really want it and everybody around me is doing it, but God says that that's not right. Then we have to say no to ourselves deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus. Sometimes it's not that things are wrong and they violate uh, the, the standards in the kingdom of God. Sometimes it's in this season or at this moment we say no even to good things in order to have better things. Again, back to me running. It's, it's not, it wouldn't have been wrong for me to stop running. This was not sin for me to stop running yesterday. But sometimes we choose, because we want to be people of character in the kingdom of God, we choose to say no to certain things for a season, in a moment, because we want better things in our lives. This is a little bit foreign to us. Paul actually talks about this in one of his letters. <clears throat> he talks about married couples abstaining from sex for a season so that they can focus their attention more fully on prayer. When's the last time I preached a sermon on that? I mean, like, we don't, that's, we don't think that way. We don't go, like, even good things. Sex within marriage, God designed it. It's beautiful. It's a gift, right? But there are seasons where it's not only okay, but to follow Jesus means that we say no to good things because we want to focus on even better things, because there are other works that God is wanting to do in us. But that's not the way that we typically function in our culture, and to follow Jesus means that we need to learn and grow 
in that capacity. So my question to you this morning would, I go back to the first question, how often do we say no to ourselves? And I hope you can hear it in my voice, see it on my face, hear it in my words. There's no condemnation in any of this. We are all working our way towards Jesus, seeking to be in a position where we receive his grace and receive his goodness, understand more fully who he is. And in that process, we're going to botch it. We're going to make mistakes. And there's a pretty good argument that can be made that even in those mistakes that we make and in those failings, we can actually learn to understand his grace more deeply. So if you're sitting here going like, dang, this is me, like I'm living this, there's no shame in that. There's the opposite of that. There is God in his grace and in his goodness calling you and I out of our places of brokenness and into his light. So practical applications for us. Um, My challenge to you would be to say no to yourself this week. Just to practice it, to build that muscle and not meaninglessly, maybe, maybe we need to pray and ask God, God, are there things that I need to say no to in my life? There probably, as I've been speaking, as we've been reading God's word, probably there are things that are coming to your mind and you already know that. So maybe it's you bringing those things to the Lord. If not, maybe to ask him, God, are there things that I need to say no to in this season? Maybe it's because it violates your kingdom principles and your truth, your standard of holiness and righteousness, or maybe it doesn't, but in this season, you're asking me to give that up, to say no, I'll do it. I mean, One of our values is that we're all in. To follow Jesus means that we hold our lives with an open hand. There's nothing off limits to God. There's nothing that he can't meddle in because it's not actually him meddling. He's our creator. He gets a say in every part of our life. Um, So what do you need to say no to yourself on this week? Let that question kind of ring in your ears throughout this week. And then I would say fasting is a great practice to build this idea of saying no to ourselves. Choosing to go without food specifically, even just for a meal, so that we can spend more time in God's word or spend time in prayer. Um, It's amazing how much that shows us that our stomach is our God. (laughs) Because I get hangry and I get miserable and I get mopey and I get like same thing as running, where it's like, you're fine. You, you don't need to skip this many meals. Like, you could stop a little bit shorter. God wants you to enjoy that grilled cheese and tomato soup that your children are eating right now that looks so amazing, and you just want to devour it. You know, like, it's amazing when we fast what we see about ourselves. Justin Early, uh, author of The Common Rule, he says this, fasting is to let your desires hang out in the open where you can observe them. Not to judge them, and not to shame them, but just when we fast, we see what our desires are that are actually animating us. They're hung out in the open, and we can go like, okay, that's interesting. I didn't know I was being driven this much by this particular thing. So what do you need to say no to this week? And allow that to hang your desires out for observance, not for shame and not for guilt, but there might be things where we need to go, God, I repent of that. Like, I'm going to choose to not live that way because that's not honoring to you and I'm realizing that now. And I'll accept your grace for that. So, let's close in prayer. Lord, we come to you this morning and um, we're so, so grateful that there is no shame in you. That, Jesus, you stamped that out from our lives. Shame is not found in you. It's not found in you. And so God, we can come before you. We can hear a harder word or a challenging word like this this morning without our defenses having to be raised, God. So Lord, we come before you this morning and we just ask, would you, would you hang our desires out for us to see? And if there are ways where we're being formed more by hedonism, more by our desires and our enjoyment and our comfort and our pleasure, it's calling the shots more than what it's supposed to, God, would you lovingly show us that? And would you lead us to a place where we can follow the the lead of Jesus in seeking the kingdom first? and allowing everything else to be added to us in due time. God, we want all of the goodness of the world, but we want it 
in its proper place, in its proper light, in light of your goodness and who you are to us. We love you, Lord. Would you lead and direct our steps today and the rest of this week? In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, thanks for being here this morning. Thanks for joining us online. Thank you for hanging with me. I appreciate it. Oh, I do want to throw out here, uh, any Packers fans that are in the house, um, <clears throat> I understand that they're playing next Sunday at 8.30 in the morning. I was grieved when the schedule came out, okay? I know that it means that I can't watch the game. I would just encourage you, the second half is where everything happens anyway, so just show up. <laughs> Stream online, uh, join us for first service, and then you'll catch the second half afterwards, all right? Uh, Love you guys. Have a great rest of your Sunday.